Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to week eight. This week we'll be talking about Congress. This first lecture is going to focus on kind of the institutional design and organization of Congress. We'll also be looking at the type of um, justifications that the framers gave to why Congress is organized the way it is in the Federalist Papers. Uh, and, and thinking about, and we'll kind of raise this more for discussion section on Wednesday, thinking about the political implications of this institutional design. Um, so to get started, think about what is it that Congress does? Well, Congress is the, legis as we have kind of talked about, the Congress is the legislative branch branch of the federal government. It's the, has the, it's the sole lawmaking authority. Uh, as Article 1, Section 1 states that all legislative powers shall be vested in the Congress that consists of the Senate and the House. And this legislative powers, there's really three types. There are the enumerated powers that are listed in Article 1, Section 8. This is all of them. I'm not going to go and read all of these to you, but these include taxes, paying debts, uh, borrowing money, regulating commerce, regulating immigration, coining money, preventing counterfeiting, the post office, uh, copyrights, um, courts, establishing a court system, punishing piracy, declaring war, maintaining an army and a navy, um, provide for militias, um, and to ex and have complete legislative authority over the district of Columbia, uh, which of so these are the kind of explicit powers granted by the Constitution to Congress, but they're also implied powers that, that are necessary to carry out these enumerated powers. The last clause in Article 1, Section 8 is that Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. Here, this, uh, these have, these, this is known as the necessary and proper clause. And the idea here is that Congress should have authority to make any laws that are necessary in order to do the things that it's required to do. Um, so these are implied by the enumerated powers. And these are also, in, they're also inherent powers that don't have any sort of constitutional basis, but are definitional uh, for what a sovereign, for what a government is. And these include, um, controlling borders, expanding territories, defending itself against revolution. Now, we often think of, now while the, uh, the kind of Congress and the presidency and competition, um, the Constitution and the Federalist Papers both treat Congress as the most important branch of the federal government, but since the mid 20th century, um, for the last 50, 75 years, the executive branch has steadily encroached on Congress's authority. And there's a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that the kind of complexity of policymaking has increased as you know the world has gotten more complex, the country has gotten bigger, the kind, um, the kind of, there's just more going on. And that's led to increased deference to executive agencies, think, uh, agencies like the EPA, the FEC, the SEC, the FCC, um, all, uh, all of these different executive agencies that are in part of implementing policy, there's been greater deference to these agencies to kind of, in, um, kind of have more autonomy and, and regular and engaging in policy. And then there's also been increasing deference as the United States has become more and more of a world power deference to the executive branch over foreign policy and national security. These include things like the war powers act uh, following Vietnam. Um, but also the kind of post September 11th authorization of military force, which is still kind of being used to justify the use of American forces around the world, you know, well over uh, almost two decades since 9-11. So if we kind of recall back to our discussion of the constitutional compromises, um, the, the, the Senate, the, the Congress itself is, broke, is a bicameral legislature in that it has two houses, right? That the, the that there is the Senate and the House of Representatives. But this, this actually goes back further in history to, uh, we can go all the way back to Aristotle's mixed regime, um, that his ideal regime would have elements of both a pure direct democracy and an aristocracy or in a government that is ruled by the elite. Um, and the, the division between the House of Lords and the House of Commons in England dates back to the medieval period. Um, and so we can think about this as kind of extending much farther back in time. 
but like, but why, why should we have a Senate in the first place? Like, what is the purpose of the Senate? Well, in Federalists 62 and 63, um, Madison gives us a series of reasons why we should have the second higher house that is distinct from the House of Representatives. Uh, the first is that he think they argued that the having this additional hurdle that all legislation has to go through would better protect liberty. It's going to be a better, it's going to be better protect the people because any sort of aggressive expansion of federal power will have an additional check on it. It'll also work to moderate um, factions, um, that, though, especially because the Senate was going to be more of an elitist and more aristocratic um, and less, uh, less succumbed to the popular will. It was originally intended not to be directly elected by the people anyway, so it would be less affected by kind of factions and mob rule. Um, it, the kind of idea behind the Senate also would that you would create a, a, a class of people with special knowledge of the law. They had longer terms. They'd be selected by state legislatures, not elected. So they for their kind of higher education and specialized knowledge um, that where the kind of that because the Senate has longer terms, it would have more stability than the House of Representatives that is constantly turning over with, free, with elections every two years. Um, and it would also create a kind of national character to the union, the Senate, this kind of um, stable, long lasting elite aristocratic body would create a kind of unity among the different states. And um, if the Senate was necessary to, for, to kind of maintain long term projects and consider the common long term good of the country and not just the immediate electoral needs. So the, the kind of key idea here is the Senate was intended to kind of moderate the democratic excesses of the House of Representatives. So is this bad? Is this a threat to republicanism? Should, shouldn't we be afraid of the Senate? Um, Federalist 63 goes through a lot of um, historical analogies to kind of argue that this is impossible. Um, but the, the key argument here that Madison makes is that um, bicameralism that the kind of democratic aspects of the House of Representatives here is that is going to maintain and limit the power of the Senate. They argue that if there's ever going to be a kind of a kind of an aristocratic coup in which the Senate tries to take over power, that the people and the House the representatives with the people by their sides will at all times be able to bring back the Constitution to its primitive form and principles against the force of the immediate representatives of the people, nothing will be able to maintain even the constitutional authority of the Senate, but such a display of enlightened policy and attachment to the public good, um, that because they would always be checked by the House of Representatives and that the people's democratically elected representative, that senators would have to kind of pledge themselves to the common good or they'd lose any sense of legitimacy or authority. Um, so they kind of really believed that this bicameral system was going to create enough kind of checks to prevent the consolidation of power in the Senate and that you wanted a more elitist Senate to balance the kind of dangers of mob rule from the House, but you also wanted the democratically elected House to kind of prevent the, the government from becoming an aristocracy. So if we're thinking about the institutional design of the Senate, um, we, there's lots of differences here. Um, on the one hand, the eligibility requirements are different. In the House, you have to be 25 and a citizen in seven years, a citizen of the United States, and they are directly elected. Where in the Senate, uh, you have to be at least 30 and a citizen for nine years. Um, and they were originally chosen by state legislatures before the 17th Amendment allowed for the uh, direct election of senators. So why, according to Madison, do we have these distinctions? Um, and Madison argues that it's explained, quote, by the nature of the senatorial trust, which requiring greater extent of information and ability of a character requires at the same time that the senator should have reached a period of life most likely to supply these advantages. Um, again, but if the Senate's supposed to be this kind of moderating force, these kind of elder statesmen, these wide men, wise old men, I mean wise old men intentionally here, that are going to kind of um, moderate the democratic excesses of the House, then you want slightly older people, people who have had more experience in the world, who are more educated, who have been in politics longer than in the House, right? So that you're going to have um, this, you're going to have a more elite, more experienced class of senators than representatives. 
So if we're another key difference is in the kind of representation schemes, where as we've talked about, the House of Representatives shall be apportioned based on population, whereas in the Senate, all senator all states have two senators. Um, so this representative. So why does Madison defend these different representational schemes? Um, and it's it's here. It's if we think back to the, his discussion of republicanism in our kind of original discussion of the constitutional principles, that Madison believed that the gov that the government the Constitution was creating was both national and federal in different respects. So. It's and for the government to be truly national, if it indeed be right, uh, he writes that among a people thoroughly incorporated into one nation, every district ought to have a proportional share in the government. And so, if we're going to have a national government, then the people should the people should be the people should be represented as a nation, and the representation should be proportioned to the where the people live. But at the same time, if we're going to have a federal system in which the states retain independence and some autonomy then um, we need to have equal representation among each state. So the Senate kind of is a more federal system, is more based on the idea that the states are independent and equal, or the House of Representatives is more national, based on the idea that the people are sovereign. It also, we, there are key differences between the House and Senate for the term periods. The uh, House is elected every two years, or the Senate is elected. Senators have six-year terms. And Madison, again, defends these different term lengths in, federal, in Federalist 61, um, that it's uh, 51 and 62, sorry. Um, that the, it's important to have frequent elections in the House. He writes, as it is essential to liberty that the government in general should have a common interest with the people. So it is particularly essential that the branch of it under consideration should have an immediate dependence on and intimate sympathy with the people. Frequent elections are unquestionably the only policy by which this dependence and sympathy can effectively be secured. That should make sense, right? Frequent elections ensures that the representatives represent the interests of the people. Where Senate, because your goal of the Senate is not this democratic representation, but this more moderation of passions and faction, this kind of slow things down and have more wisdom. Um, and so you have, so here the idea is if you want a sense of stability because um, because you want, you need, if you're going to have kind of change over in one branch that uh, Madison writes, that, that creates a necessity of some stable institution in the government. Uh, because if every, if you're going to have constant change of opinion, um, that, that you're going to have a change in policy and a continual change, even of good measures, is inconsistent with every rule of prudence and every prospect of success, that you're not going to have an effective government if the whole thing is constantly changing. So, if we're thinking about the apportionment, um, that means we are going to have 100 senators, two from each of the 50 states. And according to law, the, ho uh, the House is permanently capped at 435 members. And that means that the, the every 10 years after the census, we get redistricting and reapportionment of senators based on, or members of the House based on shifts in population. Right, and so you can see um, this is from the 2010 census. Obviously, we don't have the data, the effects of the 2020 census yet. But certain states, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, lost member representatives. For other states, Texas, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, Washington, gained representatives. And in addition to um, kind of this reapportionment, we also have the redrawing of new district boundaries. Uh, which is done at the by the state legislatures, as done at the state level. The states determine what the electoral districts of the House of Representatives are, and this can lead to the process of gerrymandering, or the manipulation of legislative district boundaries as a way of favoring a particular candidate, of drawing districts around particular communities and neighborhoods that are more likely to vote in one way or the other in order to protect certain uh, uh, certain um seats is safe and so we you have kind of we can look at the city of austin here and how you get these weirdly drawn districts um at different points in time uh, all kind of converging in over the city of austin that create protections of different house seats so why might this be a challenge i encourage you to think about but also think about like is there any instances in which gerrymandering could be defended as more democratic 
The other challenge here to think about apportionment is that there's roughly one member of Congress for every 700,000 people in a district. Um, is that enough people in Congress to actually truly represent it? Represent, represent you. If there's one member of Congress for seven, if they're supposed to represent the views of 700,000 people, is that really even possible? And so when we're thinking about representation, we can think about representation in a few different ways. And there's two main models of representation. We've already talked about this a little bit. There is a trustee model of representation, as your textbook defines, a representative who understands their role to be a trustee believes he or she is entrusted by their constituents with the power to use good judgment to make decisions on the constituents' behalf, right? That you choose candidates, uh, representatives to exercise their own good judgment and, uh, and what they think is best for their constituents. In contrast, a delegate model is that the representative is really just kind of like a mirror or a transferal of the interests of the constituents. That their job is not to kind of think for themselves or make judgments, but just do whatever um, the people kind of want them to do. Uh, we can also think of representation in terms of descriptive representation rather than substantive representation. And here is we might be concerned of whether or not um, the racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, gender, and sexual identity makeup of Congress is representative of the makeup of the, of the United States as a whole. And so if we're looking at the new Congress, if we're looking at the racial makeup, um, over 70% of the House and over and almost 90% of the Senate are white, that is not accurate in terms of the makeup number, proportion of uh, Americans who are white, right? And that white people are overrepresented in Congress. There are only 3% of senators, and this with the Senate, it's easy. That's three senators are black, um, six are Hispanic or Latino. Um, and so like, that's not great representation there. We can also look at education level where it becomes even more striking. Um, a third of the Senate and more than a quarter and almost a third of the House have law degrees. Most Americans don't even have a bachelor's degree, right? Um, three senators have PhDs, less than 3% of the population have PhDs, um, but there's a, kind of an overrepresentation of advanced degrees. And then we can also look at religion. Um, Catholicism has the greatest number of members in Congress, um, despite uh, not being kind of the majority of Christian denominations in the United States, more, there are more Protestants than Catholics. Um, there's only three Muslims and three Hindus in Congress, uh, in, in the House of Representatives, none in the Senate. Um, there's really no discussion here of atheists or agnostics in the in the Congress, despite there being large numbers of atheists and agnostics in the population as a whole. And so I'll leave the kind of question up to you in terms of like, is that good or bad? Is that descriptive, lack of descriptive representation problematic for um, democratic representation? So do you feel that you're represented by Congress? And so we also get into this question of collective representation, which your textbook des describes as the relationship between Congress and the United States as a whole, and that whether the institution itself represents the American people, not just a particular member of your district here. Um, so we might think that um, we're looking at the institution as a whole, and this becomes a kind of challenge, at least according to the data. According to many polls, Congress approval rating is in the teens, sometimes even lower. Um, so Congress as a whole, um, yet this doesn't seem to affect incumbency advantage, despite that everyone hates Congress or individual the approval ratings of individual representatives. And this is known as Fino's paradox, um, that people approve of their individual representative, but they strongly disapprove of Congress as a whole. Um, and so why might why might this what might be the explanation for this? Um, Part of this, we'll talk about next uh, in the next lecture, that people, the same behavior that, in, that gets, partisan behavior that people hate in the abstract actually gets rewarded at the individual level. And part of it is it's always easier for individual members of the House or Senate or individual senators to say, oh, it's not me. Look at all the good things I'm doing for you. It's all these other people that are the problem. 
So if we're thinking about organizing Congress, um, we can think that Congress has a, it's organized by the parties who, who organize individual members into conferences, um, Republicans uh, or caucuses for the Democrats. And these conferences or caucuses, these party organizations have leaders, the, both the majority, if you're in the majority, if it's a majority leader or a minority leader and whips who are in charge of kind of maintaining vote counts and trying to ensure that parties vote for the right vote decisions. Um, the Speaker of the House is the only uh, House officer mentioned in the constitution. Um, they have the ability to, the speaker is the presiding officer of the House of Representatives, the, meeting, the partisan leader of the majority party, and a representative of a single district. Um, the holder of this position since 1947 is second in line to be president after the vice president. Um, and so the Senate leadership um, and the speaker has a lot of power. Um, and so does the Senate leadership, but the Senate leadership is a little bit different. Um, the, the kind of is technically led by the vice president who casts tie breaking votes, but the constitution allows for the president, the Senate to choose a president pro temp, usually the most senior member of this majority party who presides over the Senate uh, in day-to-day -day operations. This is, despite its fancy name, usually a formal and powerless role. And it's the majority leader of the Senate who, like the Speaker of the House, controls what bills come to the floor, what, what the rules of debate will be, what the agenda will be. So whoever has the majority really has significant power over what Congress will do. Congress is then organized into different committees to engage in, to do its legislative work. Um, there are standing committees, and these are also known as permanent committees, and these are the beginning of the legislative process where bills are referred to in the first step of legislation. Um, there are different standing committees in the House and the Senate. Um, there are more in the House, um, but we have, uh, there is no rules committee in the Senate. Uh, there is a judiciary committee in the, um, in, the in both, I'm sorry, the judiciary is in both um, the ways and means is in the House uh, because all appropriations bills begin in the House of Representatives. Um, but these are kind of the main policy areas. And so you kind of have a specialization of expertise and labor here for the different, for legislation. We also have joint committees, and these are committees that are made up of members of both houses, usually for special like investigations or, or hearings, uh, but have no legislative power. Um, these are the joint committees on the economy, library, printing, and taxation. Then there are conference committees. These are especially called convened members of both, um, include members of both houses to reconcile differences between the House and Senate bills. Um, the ACA kind of was resolved through a conference committee of the American Affordable Care Act. And then we also have ad hoc or special committees that are called for specific purposes, such as the 9-11 uh, investigation, the House Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, the House Select Committee on Benghazi. Committees are chaired uh, and are also kind of for, have chairpersons and the membership of the committee is determined by party leadership. And the majority party has a majority on the committee. Um, so you want this, so members of Congress might be influenced on, you know, making sure they don't piss off party leadership so they can be on the committee that is going to best help them deliver re wins for their home district. The committee chair is the ranking member of the majority party. Uh, they control the budget, they determine the schedule for meeting and what bills will be, con will be considered. Um, uh, they can, they can convene a meeting. Uh, when members of the minority are absent, they can adjourn a meeting when things aren't progressing the way they want, right? And so there are that kind of having a committee chair is a, is a particular is really influences the ability to get legislation done. So next lecture will focus on the legislative process with the obligatory schoolhouse rock video and why all of it is wrong, as well as thinking more critically about explaining why members of Congress behave and vote the way they do. So what, what kind of explains the behavior of members of Congress? So that's what we'll talk about in lecture 8.2.